testing. Can anyone hear me? If you're watching right now and you can hear me, please let me know in the in the chat. I just want to make sure that the sound is working. Okay, good. Thank you, guys. Hello to everyone. We'll start in a little bit because it's it's still a bit early. This is just the sound check. And that's the RPG Pundit's cat. Well, one of the two of them. You got my pipe. Got to do things right. Where is that? Like tobacco. Here we are. <laughs> I like that. Solomon Kane says, We can hear you. The SJWs can hear you too, and they're afraid. Cross says Cults of Chaos Rocks. Thank you for that. I also see you you picked up um, the RPG Pundit Presents on the Guide to the Aristocracy, um, which uh, I thank you for. And he, he says it's a gem of information, very helpful about learning how to make aristocrats fit into the uh, into a medieval authentic context and how to play them appropriately and all kinds of useful little tidbits about things like titles and offices and how you address them and so on and so forth. Brian Harris says, greetings from socialist Oregon. <laughs> Daniel Cathay says, Cathay, Daniel Cathay, is that right? Says, I seriously can't recommend Cults of Chaos enough. If anyone who cares is listening seriously, it is awesome. Thank you very much. Marcelo Sepulveda says, congratulations, RPG Pundit, and thank you. And the congratulations is on account of the fact that if you're just tuning in and weren't already aware, this is the live stream I promised I'd do when we got past 1,000 subscribers. In fact, we zoomed past 1,000 subscribers over the weekend. I couldn't do this on the weekend because I was uh, busy with stuff, but... Uh, but we are now at something like, the last time I checked, we were at 1,027 subscribers. Uh, so thank you to everybody who has recently subscribed. She's noticed something, a noise, another cat maybe. Um, Dave Pettit says, hi from sunny Wollongong, Australia. Is that near the Wollumbaloo Dirt Monument, Dave? Gotta love Australian names. Josh James says, be careful, pundit. If you get too many subscribers, Will Wheaton will declare war on you. I'm pretty sure he has me blocked on Twitter. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I seem to recall that. So, we're just starting up here, 19 of you watching, so that's very nice, giving it a couple of minutes. I'm starting out a little slowly so that we have time for any stragglers to come in. I had a couple of things I was thinking of talking about. There's Cults of Chaos again. Um, and But I'm also really... Uh, open to answering questions or for you guys to suggest things that you might like me to talk about because after all this is not really a live stream in honor of me it's a live stream in honor of you the people who have subscribed and it's it's me showing gratitude to you guys right it's not about how awesome i am um so if you guys want to 
to suggest something. I mean, of course, I reserve the right not to not to go ahead with it, but I'll be glad to to chat about things you propose. And I'm kind of debating whether or not I should at least periodically or momentarily rather get off the the RPG track to mention a few things about the the tragic uh, burning down of Notre Dame Cathedral. Iron Cross says, I would like to get more advice on medieval realist DMing. Well, um, as I just mentioned, uh, one, one example of that was the RPG Funded Presents source book that just came out, number 74, which is a guide to medieval authentic aristocracy, which explains, you know, what they did, how they actually acted, how their day was, all this sort of thing. Um, do you have, Iron Cross or anyone else, do you have specific aspects of medieval realist DMing that you might want advice on? Because uh, if so, I'll be glad to address those. I think actually the, the topical subject of the day in some way connects onto that. I had a little argument with my in, uh, inappropriate characters co-host Grimm where he was saying, uh, he said something, he, Grim Jim is a guy who has never ever met a controversy he didn't want to run in front of and be completely run over by, right? Like the guy, I think he's a very special kind of masochist. This is my own suspicion. I think he is sexually aroused by, by putting himself in the most controversial place of an argument possible and being absolutely flattened by the negative responses he generates. <laughs> but he said something along the lines of how um, just because, you know, it, it's a terrible fact that this cultural artifact burnt down, we shouldn't all, you know, delve into superstition or something like that, right? And I pointed out in, in response to his tweet, because he said we should all be rational, right? And I said, well, a, a, a culture based on material positivism would never have been able to create Notre Dame in the first place. And that, in a way, is something that is very much related to medieval authentic or medieval realist DMing, as Iron Cross put it. Um, we ha you have one of the main parts of playing a medieval authentic game is being able as much as possible to enter into the paradigm of this other place, right? There's a famous historic historian saying, which is the past is another country, right? It was another way of looking at all of reality itself, right? Um, as much as in, a, in the way that a very foreign culture would have com a completely different worldview, our own culture in the past had a completely different worldview, particularly in the shift from postmodernism to modernism and modernism to you know, pre-modernism, right? Um, the, the people that created Notre Dame don't exist anymore, right? And I don't just mean literally the, the people that worked on building it. I mean that people now in our modern Western culture are mourning the destruction of a historical artifact or they're mourning the destruction of um, something that was really beautiful and that they understand was really beautiful um, but they don't really understand what it was anymore, right? They didn't, for the most part, I mean, there are some very tiny groups of holdovers, right? But they don't really grasp the context of what it would have meant for a medieval peasant from rural France to go to Paris and to walk into Notre Dame Cathedral and look at the structure there. And I'm saying this from from personal experience, not in the sense that I was ever a medieval peasant, um, but that I have, you know, I, I, I've been to Notre Dame, um, and I, when I was there, I was putting myself in the context of what it would have been like. It would have been something utterly otherworldly. It would have been literally getting to see proof of God, right? No medieval peasant could have gone into Notre Dame without 
having a transcendent religious experience that absolutely made clear what they already knew as a as a basic truth of their paradigm which was the existence of god and its and and his glory right and this is something that that people today can't experience in the same way because we do not have as a fundamental part of our modern paradigm that same context of belief we there are people of course who believe in god but even then the way they believe in god today is not the way a medieval peasant believed in god people believe in god today in the sense of something that they wish to be true or that they feel very strongly in their heart to be true but it's different a medieval peasant believed in god the way we believe in gravity right as something that is a basic fact of nature and reality so it's completely different. In fact, it's in a way kind of the opposite. You have, um, you, you have a belief in God in the modern sense as a counterpoint to something that you know to be true. You believe instead of, instead of knowing, you, you, you have to believe it. But a, a, somebody who lived in the medieval European worldview would have looked at that and they would know that God was an absolute fact, right? And so belief is not about overcoming doubt in the possibility of existence of God, but in rather in belief in, a, in this much more positive sense of dedicating one's life to something you know to be true already, you know? So people believed in God in the 15th century in the way that today we might um, believe in let's say, the civil rights movement, right? Or that we might believe in um, taking care of, of, of defenseless children or something along those lines. Right? It was something that the belief was about how much are you willing to dedicate yourself to something that you already know is not only true but good, you know? Or are you, or are you going to turn away from that? It wasn't a question of, of overcoming doubt um, about the reality of God. It was about overcoming your own... Um, doubt about your um, about your commitment to God. So this is another way of understanding things and of looking at things, right? It, it it also means that it's very sad that Notre Dame. I mean, obviously, it can be rebuilt in the same in the sense of a fa facsimile being reconstructed. But besides all of the elements of history that went into it, it's not going to be the same because the people who have rebuilt it are rebuilding it in the sense that a an archaeologist would rebuild or reconstruct some artifact that belonged to some other people. This isn't, this isn't the people that made it, and they don't feel about it the way that it was actually meant to be felt about. It, it's now a museum, whether or not it's an actual museum. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> Trevor Hurst asks, are you making this up as you go? Well, I, I'm not reading from a script, if that's what you mean. I'm expressing my thoughts that I've just been thinking about over the course of the day. So, yes, I am, I am, I am improvising what I say, which means that I might not always say the right things. <laughs> so there you are. Um, let me go back a bit here and just see if there are some comments I have missed. Um, we've got... Daniel Cathay says, uh, off topic, but could you please recommend how to get into pipe smoking? Well, that's a, that's a, that, that we go from the crisis of the modern West to how to smoke a pipe. I love that. <laughs> um, how to get into pipe smoking. Well, what you need to do, uh, I would recommend that you find a good tobacconist in your local area, if it's at all possible, if there is one. And there's, it, th that's that's more rare these days than one would hope right but if if there is one then do that and if not check out something like pipesandtobacco.com which is one of many online if you're in the states there there are equivalents in other parts of the world uh, where you can order pipes and tobacco and what i'd suggest is you start with a couple of inexpensive pipes the maybe the the best quality inexpensive pipes because like if you buy a a 30 or 50 dollar briar pipe that's to say a wooden pipe 
those are really crappy pipes and they're they're not going to taste nearly as good as one would hope the the best quality really cheap pipe is a corn cob pipe believe it or not and i know that looks kind of funny but this is a pipe that'll cost you like i think 12 dollars. this is a missouri meerschaum i think that's probably what uh, this size of corn cob will go for these days and it'll smoke heads and tails better than any briar pipe under a hundred dollars so that's that's to me one of the best ways to start is to get that and then get a couple of different blends of tobacco now i personally would recommend that you that you get a manly tobacco that tastes like tobacco right i know that there's some people for whom the fun is to smoke these aromatic blends that have you know all kinds of vanilla or cherry or chocolate or strawberry or whatever avocado flavor something like that right but to me the point is to smoke tobacco that tastes like tobacco and, and this is stuff like virginia leaf burley's uh, latakia which are tobaccos that have that are either different strains of tobacco or that have been cured in different ways but that don't have artificial flavoring added to it um, there's a ton of different things to try though so maybe you are a guy that's really going to like a cherry blend and and the only way you'll know is by tasting it. So you have to, to try it out over time. Check out on YouTube. There are lots of different tutorial videos about how to properly pack and light a pipe, which is the biggest hurdle for a new pipe smoker is to kind of get a hang of how to do that well. My experience is that most first time pipe smokers will either dramatically underpack their pipe or dramatically overpack it. And that's what causes them all the difficulties. So in brief, that's kind of where to start. Right. If you're if you're asking what to smoke, well, um, if you're in the U.S., I would recommend that maybe one of the, the places to, to begin with are what are called the American English blends, which are relatively soft blends of, you know, tobacco that tastes like tobacco that are very tasty. And it's hard to really um, not enjoy those. There used to be a lot of these and now there's a lot of recreations of some of the older recipes. Some of my favorites are stuff like country doctor or barking dog um, I like both of those quite a bit there's walnut um, Cornell and deal check out Cornell and deal as a blend as a brand they make a, a wide variety of pipe tobaccos that are all very good quality so you you may enjoy almost anything they make but they do make a number of American English blends morning drive is one I like a lot check out Go to my blog. At the end of every blog, I put what I'm presently smoking and anything I've, I'm currently smoking in, at the very bottom of my blog um, is going to be a blend that, that I would personally recommend because it's what I enjoy to smoke. Um, next up, Marcelo Sepulveda says, off topic, I wanted to ask how your games contribute with intersectional feminism. Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> In my opinion, they probably don't. You, you need to check out, I guess, the last video I did before this one, where I was pointing out that, you know, uh, intersectionalism is essentially a gigantic catch-22 that is just meant to divide people and cause problems for people. VAV in terms of gaming, that let's say you make a game world where, you know, like Dark Albion, where basically it's all based on European culture, you'll be called a racist for not including other cultures. You make a game that includes other cultures, like say Arrows of Indra, and you'll be called a racist for cultural appropriation, right? So uh, I, I think the main way I contribute to intersectional feminism is that I help destroy it. Um, somebody with a name in Cyrillic, I'm not gonna try to to pronounce it says yesterday I ordered a hardcover copy of Lion and Dragon all the way to Russia well thank you very much uh, I, I I don't know if you're associated with the the Putin government but uh, here you are there here <laughs> they're gonna be saying now you know there's evidence of collusion between the RPG pundit and the Putin government <laughs> um, Vision Storm says I might be getting a job soon we'll finally be able to get pundits books well I certainly hope you do Vision Storm uh, if you're living in the U.S., it's kind of hard not to find a job these days, thanks to President God Emperor Trump. Um, Iron Cross says, which is the best, best way to create a witch's coven in my world? Which class would you use? I'm using a homebrew class. How do you represent a medieval witch in a medieval campaign? Well, 
That's a, that's a very interesting question. If you look at Cults of Chaos, this is a source book that is meant to have a bunch of random tables for you to create things like a coven of witches. And um, in, in the Dark Albion setting in Cults of Chaos and Lion and Dragon, one of the things I note is the, you know, corruption or mutation, which is to say the, the physical and mental and spiritual corruption that happens from um, making pacts with demons rather than with trying to bind demons through summoning, right? Like a, um, a magician or magister or what have you who is um, a, de a devotee of, of God or of the unconquered son or what have you, of, of, you know, he serves the forces of law. He will summon demons, enter into a battle of wills with them and bind them so that they are now obliged to, to perform uh, some kind of a holy service. Whereas a cultist will summon a demon and make a pact with them whereby they will receive dark powers but these dark powers usually come with corruptions or mutations. And uh, this is one way to present NPC witches. I would give them a, you know, check out Cults of Chaos. There's the, all of the, there's a whole section on mutations with a list of different medieval authentic style mutations that you could have, you know, corruption of the soul and body and mind, um, which includes things like witch marks and demon familiars and, um, disembodied intelligent spirits that serve you and then, you know, horrific transformations into terrible creatures, right? There are different grades of these mutations. But one way to distinguish a group of NPC villain witches from ordinary magic users or, or you know, Kimri, uh, elves, whatever you want to call them in your game, um, is to have them have these special powers. These special powers come from However, this nefarious pact that they've made with a, with some kind of a demon lord or, or higher, um, and, and that I think that has a two two sided value, which is that that first it um, it is very much a medieval authentic thing. It allows you to have a witch who could be just a low level magic user, but who has additional pa powers, but that at the same time will be stuff that you can have where your players will understand where it comes from and yet will not be able to access it unless they themselves want to become sinful and turn towards corruption. So that's how that's how I'd suggest it. Um, Raphael Meyer says, the cat boy does not believe in God. That is... That is probably true, yes. <laughs> the cat boy. The cat boy right now is uh, being hunted down in my DCC campaign by the man who would kill the cat boy and then the sky Fuhrer. So <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to help him because if they stop the man from killing the cat boy, then the sky Fuhrer gets to live and, and anyone who does try to help the cat boy will be accused of being a sky Nazi. <laughs> so they're all not you know, refusing to assist him. Except Bill the Elf, who's doing his own thing because he, he doesn't want competition. Um, Dave Pettit says, Of great interest to me is the brain-numbing assumption from many that there has been a straightforward linear projection progression sorry, in reason and ingenuity from period to period. Yeah, that's not strictly true. I mean, certainly I think that there's been a technological, intellectual, um, and you could say philosophical or spiritual evolution in human culture that is continuing to go forward in the last 10,000 years. But what you have is that there are people that are working kind of at different paradigms on the, in, in the world, depending on where they are or where they came from or things like that, which are operating simultaneously, right? So this idea that now we're, you know, well, the rationalist idea that, that, you know, before everything was pure ignorance and now everything is pure glorious reason is just nonsense. As well as this notion that some people in the West have that, that Western values are somehow just the basic values that everybody has and aren't something that needs to be developed and, and inculcated in, in, in people who were not brought up in those values that in fact western values are the weird values right that do not really fit in um and that we have to make an effort to to export those values and actively defend them um daniel cathay says last time promise i'll ask and i realize this is an extreme digression what's the most friendly way 
to get into smoking loose tobacco. I've done it before, but I don't know where to even start with a pipe. Uh, well, I'm not sure what other, well, loose tobacco as, as instead of cigarettes, right? So I think maybe I've already answered this because I'm quite a bit back in the comments here. But uh, like I said, the most friendly way is you get yourself a get yourself a corn cob, ideally. If you absolutely can't find a corn cob, then I guess you're stuck with using cheap briar pipes. And learn how to do it a little first. And then after you've done it a while and tasted a lot of different tobaccos, because the thing is, maybe, you know, pipe tobacco has more variation than any other type of tobacco in the world. Like, you know, there, there's very little difference between one cigarette and another. And cigars, of course, have differences by nationality and by whether it's a Robusto or not. But the range of cigars, especially non-flavored cigars, is just tiny, right, compared to the enormous variety of pipe tobacco that there is. Even the unflavored pipe tobacco, the pipe tobacco that's just got tobacco in it, never mind all the different flavorings that you can add. I'd say um, you have to taste a lot of tobaccos before you really decide whether you like the whole process or not. You have to learn how to pack you know, that is to say to fill a pipe and light a pipe um, properly. It's not something that's instant, right? The cigarettes are something you just light it and smoke. And, um, you know, you get what you, <laughs> what effort you put into it. Whereas pipe, pipes are something that take a little bit of education, but they're not as hard as you would think. Check out YouTube for, for uh, tutorials on this. Let me see here. Um... I'm catching up as we go along here. Raphael Meyer Theron says Chartres is going to get a boost in tourism now. Well, you know, from my time in Paris, obviously I loved Notre Dame. I also really, really loved Montmartre Cathedral, which is, I guess, now the 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 best one in Paris. Um, the best one I saw while I was there anyways. Um, Nefarious Cole says, uh, I use corn cobs like that exact one, Missouri Meerschaum. First two smokes will taste funny, but after that it's great. In my experience, that's not the case with the Missouri Meerschaum. Some cheaper corn cobs can smoke a little funny, but Missouri Meerschaum seem to be really, really well cured by the company itself. Um, it might depend on what you're smoking, though, because maybe if you're smoking a tobacco that has uh, flavoring from, you know, uh, artificial flavoring or even a thick natural additive, like, you know, that it's vanilla flavored tobacco it uses real vanilla extract or something like that, but that that makes the tobacco more gummy and, you know, more moist, that might create more flavoring. To me, the perfect tobacco to smoke in a corn cob, by the way, would be a uh, a Virginia flake of some kind, right? So really thick leaf stuff that you you know crumble up and put in there, and uh, and that would be you know the the sugars in the Virginias would really go well with the the corn cob itself. Probably the, my my favorite tobacco to smoke inside a Missouri Meerschaum would be um, Stockaby's Bullseye Flake, which is a fantastic Virginia flake. Raphael Meyer says, corn cob, corn emoji cob are some of the pundit's pipes. That's right, yes. I have three or four Missouri Meerschaums, and I, uh, I do quite love them. My pipes range in value from pipes that are, that, that new cost over $1,000 all the way down to like $12 Missouri Meerschaums. And uh, my experience is that any, as far as briar pipes go, you, the brand makes a big difference because some brands are just plain better than others. And then as far as price, I think the sweet spot as far as I'm concerned is between $100 and $300. You know, a $100 pipe is a huge difference usually from a $50 pipe or a $30 pipe. Um, but the difference between a $300 pipe and a $1,000 pipe is a lot less intense or extreme and really anything over 500 you're largely paying for um, minute details in the grain that that would only matter to hardcore pipe collector nerds and the brand that you have chosen to buy 
my absolute favorite brands of of pipes are Nirups and Lorenzetti's, both of which are pipes that most of the time are in the you know two hundred dollar range or so, and I find those better than much more expensive pipes that I've that I've bought over the years. <laughs> so we've so far been talking a little bit about medieval realism, uh, quite a bit about pipe smoking and a bit about the, the crisis in the West as relates to the uh, burning of Notre Dame Cathedral. I, I might go more into those, but I want to put an emphasis on you guys, the subscribers, because this is about you guys. This is the thousand sub special, but it's really um, about thanking the subscribers, not about tooting my own horn about how awesome it is that I've got the subscribers. I mean, it's it's awesome that you guys have subscribed to me, so thank you for that. Yordleborough says, how would you run a wilderness survival campaign? Currently running a game where the party is stranded on an island, and I've come up with a lot of things, but I'm also wondering what others would do. Well, I, I might be the wrong person to ask here, because usually I like games that um, have a mix of wilderness exploration, but that are based largely in a kind of urban environment. Um, and so like, for example, my Dark Albion campaign as a default happens in the in the central areas where there's a lot of role playing of the politics of the War of the Roses and uh, things like that. And, and quite a few urban adventures in the grittier cities and towns of 15th century Albion or England. Um, and then, you know, every couple of sessions, an expedition out to some weird tomb or barrow mound out in the wilderlands, right? Uh, when I've tried to have campaigns that were set in the middle of absolute wilderness, those haven't gone all that well for me. So maybe I'm not the perfect person to give you advice on that. Obviously, what I would suggest is you have to have the right kind of player for that. And it has to be very focused on resource management, right? If, you're, if your characters are out in the middle of a forest, a mountain, or, or the desert, and they're going to be there for a long time, then you have to make them have to take meticulous um, record of how much food, water, and other such supplies they have left, because they can't just go into town and buy more. That, that's, I think, the main advice I'd give you there. And then I guess run it as a sandbox, have interesting stuff in the wilderness, because if it's just session of, after session of you going through woods and then having random encounters, that's not going to be all that great. Um, Daniel Cathy says, artificial flavoring makes me want to vomit, both with tobacco and booze. Well, yeah, that's, that's an important point. A lot of beginners will buy... A, what they used to call drugstore tobacco. Of course, nowadays you don't so much find that at a drugstore, but you know, convenience store pipe tobacco, right? Stuff like Amphora and Captain Black. And those pipe tobaccos have a large amount of, of preservatives in them, you know, uh, art and, and artificial flavor enhancement, uh, propylene glycol and all that sort of stuff, which, you know, if one of the reasons you're going into pipe tobacco is to have a more natural tobacco smoke, you kind of want to avoid, right? I, I would suggest it, you haven't really tried pipe tobacco if you haven't tried a brand of pipe tobacco that is either all natural or only has a very light casing of, of glycol to, uh, you know, to maintain freshness or something like that. And some of my favorite tobaccos, I, I think are pretty much impossible to get in North America, which are Image Latakia and Image Virginia. Those are a hundred percent completely free of any additives, but you it's pretty much the same case with um, a lot of the higher brand American tobaccos like Cornell and Deal or GLPs or um, well, stuff along those lines, right? Samuel Gowith, too, I think. Um, let's see here. Oh, I've lost my place of where we were. Oh, here we are. Uh, Josh James says, your rubles are in the mail, pundit. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. <laughs> Daniel Cathy asks, what's your favorite way to facilitate immersion in your game worlds via play? I realize that's something of a loaded term, but I think you understand what I mean. Well, to me, immersion is not, it's not a loaded term. It's a term that a lot of people tend to 
um, fail to understand, but it's really the central point of the role playing experience. And I think that the main way to facilitate immersion is to make sure that players can can as much as possible get inside the the experience of, of being the character and putting aside other priorities like you know mechanical priorities or things along those lines. I'll show you guys this. <laughs> So anyway, um, when you're doing immersion, the things that get in the way of immersion above everything else is when the player has to think about something beyond what their character would be experiencing, seeing, or doing. So the less you do that, the better you're going to be for immersion. That's one of the reasons why all of these sorts of metagaming mechanics where the player can change the world or change reality by using points or by rules or whatever that that are not that they're not his character changing reality but the player changing reality to benefit the character or for their own interest or whatever that's that's stuff that kills immersion right there's a lot of things like that but some of them are more egregious than others certainly the kind of the stuff that you see in story games story games aren't meant to have immersion i mean if you read Ron Edward, the creator of the, the Forge style game, he makes it very clear that he doesn't want immersion in his games. In fact, he claims it's impossible to really have the experience, which shows you what he knows. Um, but, but if you look at these Forge type games where the player can say, well, I'm going to use one of my story points to say that all of a sudden, it turns out that the you know captain of the guard is married to my cousin, and so he owes me a favor, you know. And then you just change the world around you, right? The world has to feel to the player like a living world, like it's not just the backdrop for a piece of literature or a movie, um, a cheap Potemkin village sort of scenario. You have to make it something that uh, feels as real as possible. So. Characters have to, NPCs have to have an existence outside of the player characters, right? They have to be doing stuff and wanting stuff that isn't just all about the PCs. The world has to change around them, even in ways that they aren't the ones changing it. But the most important thing is that the player has to not be constantly interrupted by going outside of his character or at, at doing that as little as possible. It's one of the things that makes Lords of Olympus and, you know, when I say Lords of Olympus, I mean that entire series of, of games that started from Amber, right? Lords of Olympus, Lords of Gossamer and, Gossamer and Shadow, uh, and Amber itself. So brilliant for immersion is that you don't really even have to look at a character sheet after the initial character creation process. So all you're doing is getting entirely into your character. You just know, you know, the four basic stat, what your ranks are, and and you have an idea of what you can and can't do, and then most of my players after the first two or three sessions at most and that's only for the ones that ha are you know really not used to this other way of doing it they stop looking at their character sheet anymore they're looking at notes that they've written about stuff that's happened to their character or stuff that's happening in the campaign but they aren't looking at their stats and that makes immersion really powerful now you can't quite do that in D, &D but you you can make a point of trying to make D, D as much as possible something that is about just letting the player role play their character and not getting in the way of that. That's one of the reasons why in Lion and Dragon, I changed the experience point system. If you're trying to be medieval authentic, then you can't possibly end up having a system that uses the D&D experience system because it would be completely inauthentic for, say, a, a cleric, you know, a, a chosen paladin of God to um to to kill you know he kills some monster then he's looting the bodies right for 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 five gold pieces or whatever because that's going to be five more experience points right so the the traditional the typical OSR D D sort of experience system is one where you get experience points for killing people and for getting treasure neither of which are necessarily what characters in a medieval authentic setting will be going out of their way to do right if they are, it should be because that's what the character would do. It shouldn't be that they're doing it because that's the only way they can level up. They need the XP to level up, so they start looking to accumulate vast amounts of treasure, right? 
there should be classes like, you know, a noble has to at all times appear to be above uh, the common interest of, you know, dirty lucre, you know, of, of coins. Their treasure is in their land and things like that. And they, they should, they're not supposed to worry about money. And, uh, you know, it, it's quite inappropriate for, for the characters to, to feel, for the players to feel like they need their characters to be both killing and looting machines. Um, there are certainly some people in a medieval world that could be like that. But if, if characters that shouldn't be like that end up having to do that, that wrecks immersion. So in my experience point system in, or my experience system in Lion and Dragon, I made it very simple. You get experience for participating in the session and that's it. So you can then role play any way you want. As long as you're playing your character, there's, there's a bonus experience award for, for, for someone who's role played really well. Um, but then you can just let your character do what they want. You follow your character's goals, hopes and dreams or whatever, whatever they're trying to achieve. And you're not worried that that's going to get in the way of you leveling up and getting more hit points or something like that. And I think that that's one of the, the that's a good way to do it. It's something I'd recommend not just for a medieval authentic game, but if you're worried about making a game more immersive in general, and it would work just as well as far as I'm concerned if you're running in the Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk as if you're running in Dark Albion and uh, the War of the Roses. Uh, Daniel Cathay says, Cults of Chaos is awesome. I don't even do the OSR thing and it's still indispensable for my campaign. Seriously, excellent supplements. Thank you. That's very true. That uh, Well, the awesome part, I'll leave it to you, but that, it, that it's you can use Cults of Chaos for any OSR game. You don't have to have Dark Albion or Lion and Dragon to use it. And you can really actually use it in pretty much any um, fantasy setting. It's a set of t um, tables. Like the, There are mechanics there that relate to um, kind of OSR general mechanics. So if you're playing, you know, RuneQuest or GURPS or something like that, then you'd have to change a couple of things. But most of it is about setting up what a, a, a cabal looks like, what they're what they're into, what they're doing, what their goals are, what their complications are, how many of them there are, what their resources are, and it lets you roll up. And maybe in about you know ten or twenty minutes, through a series of rolls, you can create. A, a sect, cult, heresy, um, cabal, or what have you of sinister people um, that are going to be different every single time you roll them up because there's enough variation that, you know, I don't think you're ever going to get exactly the same cult twice. And in fact, some of them are going to look radically different from each other. Um, let me see here. Dave Pettit says, The Rights of Man is a novel innovation, but only a few centuries old. Mm. Well, yes, as the mo in its modern form. But keep in mind, there are also, there's also all kinds of historical precedent that this rests on. And that's part of the, that's part of the problem right there, is that, that um, you need to have a whole bunch of underlying infrastructure to get to enlightenment thinking. And in a lot of cases, that's a big issue, right? That, that people don't start, not only they, do they not start with enlightenment thinking, but it's not something you can just start from that. You have to teach some basic stuff before that for enlightenment thinking to work, right? You have to have certain um, presuppositions that get loaded in because this was a gradual process of evolution that led to the full-blown enlightenment values. So it's not enough if you go to like somewhere like Afghanistan and just start talking about the rights of man, that's never going to work. You have to lay out a whole bunch of groundwork underneath that. And at the, in the same sense, if that underlying infrastructure erodes in the West, then there's no way to sustain the Enlightenment thinking itself. And that's the problem we're in today, right? This is how you end up losing it all. DS says, advice for dealing with the Mercer effect in my home game. Well, I've done a video about it. I've done a couple of videos about the Mercer effect, which is where new players come in. They've, they've been watching shows like Critical Role, you know, which, are, which is done by Matthew Mercer, hence the name of it. And they end up thinking that 
a D and D game is supposed to look like a critical role game, when in fact a critical role game doesn't really look very much like a D and D game at all, because it's got besides having the production values and people hamming it up all the time and this fake emoting, excessive emoting where everyone's like really excited and the the game is crafted for the camera. It's being made so it runs really fast and snappy and it has this whole, <laughs> my cat almost woke up when I snapped, but she, she just said, fuck it and went back to sleep. <laughs> all right. So it has all of this, this, um, setup that's meant to be like non-stop entertaining for the whole show right and that's not what happens in a normal game session being run by normal people none of that stuff happens right you don't have uh, the attractive hipsters being all excited at every single thing that happens and you know you have you don't have the necessarily the same pacing even because you don't need to have it and in fact it's better not to that's what you do when you're playing for a camera, right? It's like, you know, if you're watching a porn video, then, you know, the, the stuff that porn actors have to do for the camera is being done because it'll look good in the context of porn for the camera, not because it's the most enjoyable thing to do, right? Like, it's really not. Some of the positions that they get into in a porn video are, if you ever try to do them in a normal situation of, you know, making love with someone, it's not going to be comfortable for you or her or anybody, right? It, it, th those are being done because that's what works for the camera angles and what, you know, perverts want to see the money shot and things like that, right? So uh, you, 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 you need to be able to explain to people that this is not going to be like a uh, critical role, that it's done differently, that it has a different way of pacing. And, and basically tell them to give this a chance and, and, get into it in it as its own thing not look at it as something of how you know how you would do critical role look at it as something that they're, you're going to do that's going to be enjoyable in its own special way right it's the difference between i don't know um going actually going fishing and watching some kind of high action fishing show that has been you know especially edited for the the sports channel or something like that right they're two very different things um, Buried Axe Blade says, remember kittens, cigarettes are 60% filler. Yeah, well, not just that. They also have like bleached paper and all kinds of stuff that's meant to enhance the power of the nicotine content. So it's more addictive. I mean, I, I've never smoked cigarettes and frankly, I really don't understand why anyone would smoke cigarettes. You know, like it sounds funny because you know that I'm, you know, everybody... Who knows about me knows that I'm constantly puffing on my pipe, but that's a it's a completely different experience, right? Smoking a pipe is enjoyable, right? You do it because you love it. Nobody smokes a pipe who doesn't love doing it because it's a bit, it's it's not a big hassle, but it's just a tiny bit too much of a hassle to ever want to bother with it if you're really not having a nice time, right? Which is why one of the big hurdles is getting to the point at the very beginning that it takes a couple of weeks to do where you're you're you've gotten the hang of it enough that it stops being a little bit not that fun to do it's why there's not that many people that smoke pipes right because it's a lot easier to to just light a cigarette or vape or even to, to light a cigar but pipes are to be the most enjoyable of all they, they once you've gotten that hang of it and um you know there there's a they seem to have a purpose to them uh, as far as i'm concerned um let's see what else we got iron cross has so you would use a regular uh, in the in terms of how to do a witch coven or how to make a witch npc uh you'd use a regular low level spellcaster class but with the corruption yeah that's basically what i would do that's more or less what how it looks like in well in cults of chaos you have a lot of different options for who's the leader of a sect or stuff like that but if i was doing a very classical kind of medieval witch I'd say, you know, a first to fourth level witch that also has an X percent chance of having been bound with to a demon and therefore having one or more types of corruptions. And now in, in Lion and Dragon, I make it clear in Dark Albion too that anybody can try to summon a demon. You don't actually have to be a spell casting class. So another interesting twist to that could be someone who's not a spell caster class 
but who you know did a summoning. Now summoning, it's hard for summoning to it's harder for summoning to work in L, in Lion and Dragon if you're not a spellcaster class because spellcaster classes add their level to the attempt to check. But there's two different checks involved. One is to actually summon the demon, and the second is to bind them. And of course, if you're a chaotic um, cultist you don't need to do the second one. You just need to summon them. And once the summoning actually works, then you're going to, you know, throw yourself at the demon's feet and be beg to make a pact with them and serve them. And then, you know, that that, that doesn't require a, a contest of wills. So it can be more likely that a non-spellcaster NPC would be a, a cultist in the service of a demon then that, uh, you know, a lawful NPC would be a non-wizard that had connections to demons. Um, <laughs> Vision Storm says, how to deal with the Mercer effect? Use old school energy drain on the player's characters and let them grow with a sense of reality. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a bit mean. Tough but fair, maybe. I don't know. Um, Card Captor Lee says, I love Matt Mercer's anime voice work, but he's really damaged RPGs. Okay. Uh, yeah, he has. I, I, I've never, I'm not a, a big viewer of anime, actually, so I don't really know the voice work that he's done there. But they are, everybody who works, who, who's at, critical role are voice actors and they're using their acting skills to make the show more appealing than it would otherwise be and again not just in terms of using their acting skills to interpret their character they're using their acting skills when they're acting as players who are really excited with the game right they're they're using acting to emote themselves into fake sort of excitement as players, which is, you know, like the way that you would have somebody in an infomercial being super excited about a new kind of mop, right? They're using acting skills while pretending to be an ordinary person, right? Um, Raphael Meyer says, the pundit sometimes breathes air, the rest of the time he smokes his pipes. <laughs> that is a fair assessment, I think. Fred Daniel says, I'm not French, but I've been to Paris, and I'm just sick about Notre Dame. I think of Notre Dame as the heart of my experience in Paris, sent from San Francisco. Well, yeah, I'm. I, it certainly saddens me to think, because I've been there, I was at Notre Dame, I, I was in Paris for a time, and... Uh, and to think that that there will be that from here on in anyone who hasn't been there never will be there as it was right it, i'm i'm suspecting that it will be rebuilt in in some way um but it won't really be the original cathedral anymore it won't be what it was and it won't be made by the people for whom it actually mattered and there's something of value that is lost in that because um, you know, it's different to build the cathedral as an act for the glorification of God, um, of something higher than yourself, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, in this case, it was, of course, literally for the glorification of a specific God, but it's, there's a difference between doing that and rebuilding the cathedral for the sake of some kind of cultural um, sense of vague value because it's you know art it's something that is artistic and historic plus it's really important for tourist dollars right that's not the same thing dave pettit says how does one maintain the correct tone of eerie mystery when introducing mythic elements as real within a medieval realistic setting it occurs to me it would be very easy to overdo things well yes it was so let's think about this from the paradigm of the medieval peasant, right? A medieval peasant, most of the time, has not gone very far away from where they were born, right? They spend most of their lives pretty close to the same place. Not so much, say, a medieval merchant or even most, you know, a medieval freeholder or city dweller 
is likely to travel quite a bit further afield. And some people, like if you are a merchant, for example, you might end up making incredible journeys, right? You know, Marco Polo style. In which case, in any case, you would see a lot of really incredible wonders, some of which you would interpret not as we would today as, you know, scientific elements of nature, of biology or, or what have you, but that you could interpret as fantastical, right, or supernatural. Uh, but the peasant themselves, what, what they would experience is a world that is relatively safe. But why is it safe? It's safe because it's within the realms of the king. It is protected by the church. Law is, is maintained by the aristocracy. So it's a place where human beings, with the help of spiritual powers, have brought law into a place of chaos, right? Nature, by its, by, by its own nature, is a chaotic place. It's hostile to the human being, right? People feared the woods, People didn't want to be out in raw nature. This is another element that is like very under, difficult for us to understand because most people in the modern world have grown up apart from nature and we have this very idealistic and nostalgical view of nature and even the people who don't, people who go out in nature and have kind of a, a better sense of it also have a very different view than the medieval person would because they, they long maybe, maybe you long for nature because you don't get to be a part of it on a on a daily basis and and in any case you you will you might recognize the fears of the dangers of nature but in some way the rational paradigm has diminished those fears because you you have enough information about the world to know that you you might find a bear in these woods but you're not actually going to run into a dragon right um much less the walking dead or something like that so the medieval peasant, though, to them, the forest was a terrifying place. It was a place of chaos. Anywhere outside that area that was protected by these forces, the forces of, of the temporal forces of things like the crown and the aristocracy and the spiritual forces of the church, the, these, these places where man has brought order from chaos with the help of God, um, these are the safe places. And so if you were a medieval peasant, you lived in one of these safe places. And of course, there could be problems caused by man, right? Lawlessness, crime, war, right? Violence. But you weren't expecting as a medieval peasant that you would, on a regular or daily basis, end up seeing the supernatural. Even then, there's very likely that at certain points in your life as a medieval peasant, you would have had experience of the supernatural. You would have had an experience of seeing ghosts, of seeing either, you know, some kind of literal experience of a ghost where you would have seen some phantasmal figure in the night as you were walking home from having um, drunk a bit too much at the free house. Um, or something like a will-o'-wisp, right? You would have seen strange lights that, that you think were spirits that were possibly a danger to you, right? That, that, that might have happened once or twice in your life. Um, there might have been someone who looked to be dead and then didn't turn out to be dead. That seemed to have somehow been able to revive themselves. Um, you might have, there might have been at some point in your life as a medieval peasant, an account that involved someone, some child getting too close to the woods and was mauled by a creature that looked like a half man and half wolf. Um, and, and you know, you yourself or other people you love and trust told you that they saw it that way and that's what it, what it happened, right? Um, so there's all these sorts of things. Now, not, never mind that maybe there was some person in your village that it turns out was using, you know, strange charms to try to curse their neighbor using magic and that, that that neighbor's cow died. And that, you know, that was a thing that you experienced. And that's something you really need to worry about because this is, you know, the power of the devil infiltrating into that order and trying to corrupt it. So this is the way that you would apply it in this context. Now, your characters in a medieval authentic game probably aren't peasants. They're probably adventurers who belong to those classes in the middle that get to travel a lot more uh, or even to like, you know, the aristocratic classes that might be called on to do things. And some of them will be clerics who have a divine mission to strike out against evil. 
So what happens there is that what you want to do, like I advise in Dark Albion, is have the, the core areas where humanity is centered, right? The middle of the kingdom. That's where, where things are secure, where the power of order is strong. And you should really make as little as possible of the, the supernatural experience happening there. You, you can have it happening like in the shadow. You can have stuff like cults and sects and covens that might be operating in the darkness. You might have, you know, that there's some cave or catacomb that has something um, or an unopened barrel mound. But the places where things can get really crazy is once you leave the heartlands and go out into the wilderlands, which is something only crazy people do or only people that are that are obliged to or oath bound or duty bound to do because they're adventurers or crusaders or what have you. So that's what you need to 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 do to be able to get that paradigm and to portray it realistically and to have mythical elements done in a way that it'll that it'll fit. I hope that answers your question. It was a very good question, uh, Dave Pettit. Thank you very much for it. Um, Daniel Cathy says, congratulations on your thousand subscribers. Well, thank you to all of you for subscribing. Card Captor Lee says, we subscribe because we love you, Pundit. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> let me see what else we've got here. Whoa, I'm, I'm getting way behind, but that's okay. We'll catch up eventually. I'm going to skip some of the more basic ones. Um, how do I feel about the world of Harn? Well, the Harn world is a very... Um, a very impressive attempt to create a setting that tries to be a quasi realistic. It's not based on, it's not like our world, right? But it's a world that tries to emulate elements of the dark ages, like a dark ages version or very, very early medieval version of kind of the European style cultures um, with heart itself being sort of like, I guess the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And then there's the main continent that has like the the basically collapsed Roman Empire, and uh, and it's it's very good in some ways. I think there's a few ways where it kind of screws up in that it, there's way too much polytheism going on there, and that makes it you know the the there's the, the lack of that underlying constancy of the monotheistic church. But it is good. I found that also there was a. One of the things I tried to do with Dark Albion is have just the right balance between a lot of setting detail and a lot of stuff that is that is authentic, medievally authentic, but always without crossing the limits of going beyond what is comfortable for playability. And I think Harn sometimes does that. It sometimes has a lot of stuff that is really interesting if you're like a medieval historian looking at a pseudo-medieval world but in role playing terms can can be a little dull right like that it's it's too much too much focus on setting wank you know and not enough on playability but i know that there's some harn fans that would probably really disagree with that um josh james says i subbed to the rpg pundit because i enjoy being put on lists <laughs> i can imagine what lists you're talking about um, Fred Daniel says, tobacco is new world. What did medieval Europeans smoke? Well, for the most part, as far as we know, medieval Europeans didn't really smoke anything. Um, that's not actually quite true because there were medicinal herbs that were used, um, in a, in, by smoking them, right? That, that, um, in medieval medicine, there were certain, um, herbs that the way to, to do it was to burn them sort of like what we do with like sage or sweet grass or well what we i should say what we've taken from you know native american culture of, of trying to purify someone by burning certain types of plants and having having it passed around or over their bodies and the smoke as you inhale it is supposed to help purify you or is supposed to have medicinal qualities that help to drive um drive out uh, miasma or bad humors or things like that right so there was that element and then there was also you know magicians used incense one of the ways a magician would communicate with the spirit was to fill a room with the smoke of certain particular recipes of incense and while summoning the demon or the spirit or what have you it would it would make itself visible in the movements of the smoke and send messages through that um 
most of these smokes, most of these uh, incenses didn't directly have hallucinogenic qualities, but you can kind of imagine that that would certainly help create the altered state of consciousness, the trance state in which you will end up having these visions and these experiences. But recreationally, no, not really. I mean, there's some evidence that the Romans tried smoking some stuff recreationally in certain ways, not with pipes. That's something that, that shows up later, um, that shows up with the Columbian Exchange. So unfortunately, if you're running a medieval authentic setting, you're not going to have a wizard smoking a pipe, right? And for Christ's sake, if you make a, a wizard in a medieval or not medieval setting, in a Rena Renaissance Plus setting or wherever, um, don't have them smoking those ridiculously long church warden pipes. That's not what they would have smoked. You know, they would have been smoking... The first pipes that were smoked were clay pipes, and those were the pipes that you'd be smoking. Mm -hmm. Dave Pettit says, a Mary Sue character in fiction happens when the author has abandoned the appropriate distance from his fictional character. Story control for PCs is exact same inappropriateness, just reversed. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good analysis, right? Fred Daniel says, feeling like a living world means the world mostly works like you expect. The more exotic and strange, the less real it feels and the harder it is to immerse. Yes or no? Uh, I would say it, it, it depends on how you're putting it because I think the key is internal consistency, right? A world can be really weird, actually, and it can have some very gonzo things, including, you know, physics not working the way that it works in the real world or um, there being stuff that is just kind of seems what would seem ridiculous, you know, from the real world perspective. But if you're doing it in a way that is internally consistent to the genre of the world you've created, like the point is that you can have a really silly world, but it has to seem like a living world. It has to seem like a world that is consistent in its themes, right? And then that helps to provide for that immersion experience to happen. The biggest thing that breaks immersion in terms of, of, of setting is a lack of consistency. Right. It's where you can't predict how the world is going to work um, because the world is just being used as a as a literary backdrop. Right. So some stuff might happen one way and some will happen another way, depending on what the DM at the moment thinks is important for him to push his story. And that's not not any good. That's not going to help immersion. Uh, I'm card captor Lee says, I'm curious, pundit, about what your favorite non D, D or OSR RPG as well. Uh, anyone who knows me well enough would know that it's uh, the, the Amber RPG, which was the inspiration for Lords of Olympus. That is by far my favorite RPG outside of, outside of D D or OSR games. <laughs> Dave Pettit says, experience for session immersion and participation what sorcery is this <laughs> well give it a try i know it sounds heretical to some osr folks but if if you're just kind of saying look just play your character and do what your character would do and then let the player go ahead with that um that can actually end up really changing the level of immersion in your game Daniel Cathy says, thanks for your intelligent and well-reasoned responses. How would you respond to story gamers or narrative RPG players who describe these as some evolution of role-playing games? Well, they're, they're not. They're not an evolution at all. They're a, a breakaway into a separate type of game in the same sense that RPGs are not war games, right? Uh, RPGs are not the evolution of war games. They're something that derived from war games and became a completely separate and different hobby. The problem is that story gamers realize that their particular separate and different hobby it has a very limited appeal. It appeals only to a small number of pretentious wankers. So instead, they want to try to redefine the RPG as being their game, their separate type of game, and take over the RPG hobby to try to get these people who are, who are RPG players and wouldn't actually want to play a story game to kind of be forced into it or tricked into it is a better way to put it. They're being parasites that want to suck off of the popularity of RPGs 
to support their relatively unpopular type of game. Scott Charlton asks, what qualifies you, no, what, sorry, what to you qualifies as a game, uh, what qualifies a game as an OSR game definitively? So to me, an OSR game, because you can have old school games, like, or even old school games that are, or new games that are homages to other old school games, like Raiders of Riley, for example, is a game derived from the D100 system. So it has an old school um, appeal in uh, the sense of being part of that family of the D100 games that are, you know, Call of Cthulhu and et cetera, et cetera. But that to me, I, I'm not going to put that in as OSR. I think OSR to me is games that have, at the very least, the, the most basic functional elements of the classic old school D&D rules and that lack certain elements that are absolutely new school. And that's where it gets kind of tricky uh, because there are some new school elements that you can certainly integrate because there's stuff that could have been thought up without any intermediate steps in the old school period, even if they, they weren't thought up in the old school period. So for example, let's say instead of using the standard old school saving throws, right? Like to save versus wands, spells, um, poison etc etc you use the third edition reflex fortitude and will save right reflex fortitude willpower and just those three the dungeon call classics games do, do that and and it's and that doesn't make it not an osr game it's still an osr game and the reason for this is that even though nobody in the old school period thought of that three category set of saving throws there's nothing fundamentally that requires an intermediate step or a jump in game theory, as it were, between having one type of saving throw or the other. You can do either one. So that still allows it to be there. It's kind of a case of within the revolution, everything outside the revolution, nothing, right? Like you can have all kinds of innovations. You can add and change stuff as long as what is the fundamental aspects of D&D are still there. If you break out of those fundamental aspects, if, for example, like the reason Alpha Blue is not an OSR game is because it doesn't have the fundamental elements of the D&D game experience. It's not compatible enough to be that, right? It doesn't have the six ability scores. It doesn't have the 3D18 ability score range, right? It doesn't have the ability score modifiers. It has hit points, but it generates them in a completely different way. It doesn't have the same way of doing attacks. It doesn't have the same way of handling armor. It doesn't have the same way of resolving actions or doing combat. So that makes it not an OSR game. I think that you could make, for example, a game that even if it all it had was like a really ultra light, super light OSR game. You have the six stats, the modifiers, you roll a d20 to attack. You have a single saving throw number that you can then modify as you like. Um, and you have hit points and some some form of armor class, that would still be an OSR game. Uh, Buried Axeblade says, I like how the devil in the Dark Albion cover talks out of its ass and makes the dabbler of the Dark Guards think it's telepathy from the demonic face. <laughs> well, uh, Axeblade, this is in fact a, um, an, a, a classic late medieval early renaissance era painting and it's uh, about a, uh, a a story of a um of a i believe it was a pope or a bishop who drove out the devil right and so that was a devil and it was it's surprisingly called like medieval art especially of demons is really not so right so having a, a devil having two faces one face on its ass that's par for the course for medieval artwork right and that means that if you're making a medieval a medieval themed um rpg a medieval authentic rpg you could get really really creative in the ways your demon looks like your demons and your monsters look like right your creatures look like that is that would be a one good way to make it more medieval authentic actually because um sometimes it's really very funny we have some survivalisms of this of course in in modern dnd as it were like the cockatrice you know and of course griffins all of the kind of chimeric creatures that are mishmashes of different types of creatures 
but the ones that have stayed behind are the ones that are maybe the least ridiculous types, right? Like the cockatrice is probably the most ridiculous looking one, apart from something like the catopal bass, uh, which is only appearing in some editions. But like this, these were some of the less ridiculous out of other much more ridiculous creatures that you see in medieval in medieval art. Uh, thanks again to everyone, everyone who's congratulating me on the thousand subs. I would thank all of you who have subscribed. If you're coming across this live stream and you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Please subscribe um, and hit the notification button and share this video and all the other videos. Let's keep going now. I, I hopefully, we'll be getting to 2,000 subscribers a lot faster than we got to 1,000 because I guess that's the way it goes, right? This sort of thing can accelerate. Um, and I guess I'll interrupt right now with a little commercial note to say that if you want to support me, then please um, share the videos. That's one of the big ways you can support me there. It doesn't cost you anything. Just, you know, if you put it out on any social media where you know that there are people that might be interested. And if you want to support me monetarily, I'd say first and foremost, check out my games, right? Not just my books, but also the RPG Pundit Presents series. That's a really good way you know, in lieu of doing something like Patreon. I do have a Patreon, you'll see a link to it, but you know, a lot of people don't want to use Patreon anymore for obvious reasons relating to their um, censorship of certain views. And a, a, a way that you get an immediate reward yourself is look up the RPG Pundit Presents series, find a source book that seems like it could be interesting to you and buy it. And it's like, they range from as little as 99 cents to I think maybe like 399 is the, the most expensive one or 499 at the most, depending on page count, right? And that that will be supporting me economically and you'll get something out of the bargain. So check out that. And of course, if you think it's cool at all, check out stuff like Cults of Chaos, which is, you know, our, like I said, a really great source book. And like many people today, if you don't believe me, Look at the live chat and look at how many people who have it say it's an awesome source book. It will help you be able to make villainous supernatural groups, you know, dangerous cults, sects, heretics, and whatnot. Um, and that's a good way to support me. That and subscribing and sharing. Okay, getting back to analyzing the topics of uh, that are that you guys are presenting me on the on the chat. Um, Josh James says, to me, the OSR has this whole do-it-yourself punk feel to it, in addition to being based on pre-Witches of the Coast D&D mechanics. We don't sit at the cool kid table. Well, I would say what we don't sit at is at the preppy table or the posh kids table, depending if you're British, right? Um, we're, we are punks. Yeah, I guess so. Because and, and, and in a way, there's a reason why the OSR is so disliked by the SJW crowd and why they associate, even though most... I know a lot of you watching right now probably do not identify necessarily with being right wing or something like that. But if you believe the SJWs, the OSR is just a big basket of deplorable Nazis, right? And the reason they say that is because they can't control the OSR. The OSR is democratized in such a way that there's nobody who's going to be able to say, oh, for the good of the community, I'm going to declare that this person should be, you know, banned and that anyone's going to really listen to the to that asshole, right? They're they're going to they're going to just tell them screw you. I if if I like the product, I'm going to buy it, right? And you know, the Mike Cernovich and other people have said that, you know, being right wing is the new punk because if you live in a world where the establishment is essentially leftist, right? Where yeah, and you see this especially having now had more time to interact with people who are Zoomers, right? The Generation Z kids. That it, it is so obvious to them, and and it fills me with hope to see this because um, they've grown up their entire lives. The only authority figures in their lives have been those people that are hard leftists, right? If you're my age, if you're a Gen Xer or older, or if you're uh, an early millennial, that's not the case, right? You'll remember having grown up in a time where there were authority figures that were like, you know, the religious right and stuff like that, right? These right-wing authoritarians that were trying to ban your games and your books and trying to tell you what to do or what you're allowed to say or not allowed to say um, or how you're al allowed or not allowed to act, right? That was our lives and our influencing factors. 
And it's part of why people in our generation who really aren't part of the left anymore still cling to the illusion that they are because they still think in their mind somewhere in there, there's a 12 year old whose D and D books got taken away because their parents watched, you know, Pat Robertson saying something on TV and they still want to think that the people that are fighting for their freedom are on the left and not the right. And, and that's, that's just wrong today, but they still have that in their like, you know, primitive prepubescent brain, you know, the prepubescent part of their brain that remembers that it was the, you know, they want to think it was the church lady that tried to ban the, the music they liked. Right. Um, but these kids that are coming up now don't have that experience at all. Right. To them, their entire elementary school experience, their childhood, everything, and probably even their own parents were people that were telling them what, that they, what they weren't allowed to watch, what they weren't allowed to play, what they weren't allowed to like from the perspective of left-wing authoritarianism, right? Or totalitarianism, telling them that you're not allowed to use certain words, you're not allowed to say certain things, you're not allowed to even think or feel certain things. You have to pretend to think or say things that you don't really believe because if you say what you do believe, then you're a really evil person because somebody on the left said so. And so there was a rejection of this, right? Like for that sort of a kid, the only way to be a punk is to be right wing, right? Is to be a right wing shitlord, right? So, uh, you know, the, the OSR is in a way, uh, even though, like I said, there could be tons of people in the OSR who do not identify as right wing in a sense, we are the shitlord wing of the RPG scene. We're the inglorious OSR. And I think that's part of the appeal of the OSR, right? That we don't give a crap whether you like our game or not. We care about whether the game plays right or not, right? Nobody's going to make an OSR game and uh, expect it to sell well based on a, you know, on some kind of a, a virtue signaling diversity theater thing, right? Arrows of Indra isn't a great game because it's got a trans person on the cover and it deals with, you know, the fact that in, in uh, classical Indian culture, there was a third gender, it's a great game because it's a great game and that's just one part of its setting, right? Um, so this is, this is what we do and that's part of that whole punk feel. Daniel Cathay says, I got six smoking pipes out camping probably because they're vastly more pure. Well, maybe or maybe not. I mean, the thing is you're smoking a pipe he also says, now I'm a gay vapor. I'm very sorry. Well, you should be sorry for vaping. Um, that's, that's just god awful. Like, why would anyone do that? But as far as getting, getting sick, it, it's not so much about the purity as that it's, um, it depends on how much of a smoker you were before. If you were never a smoker at all, or if you were a very light smoker, you know, one pipe Think about how long it takes to smoke a cigarette, right? And then one pipe takes, if you're smoking it at a decent, normal pace, an average sized pipe can take like between 45 minutes to an hour and a half to smoke. And the idea is you want to be like slowly and relaxedly and gently puffing on it, right? And, and if you try to like go a little too fast, which a lot of times beginners will, if you're puffing too much, if you're doing it too frequently um, or too intensely, if you're not getting that knack of just rolling it around in your mouth and not inhaling it, right? You don't have any taste buds in your lungs. You don't need to inhale pipe smoke. The experience of pipe is the flavor of the pipe and you get that from the palate, from the tongue, right? So you just need to have the smoke roll around in your mouth and then let it out. You don't need to, to suck it down into your lungs. So probably if you got sick, it's because you did those things and you might want to try doing it in a little more gentle of a way and without the inhaling bit. Uh, Million Dollar Prawn says, glad you got your streaming privileges. Thank you, Million Dollar Prawns. Uh, I, I only did it because a bunch of you guys decided to subscribe. So thank you so much. And anyone who's watching who hasn't subscribed yet, well, God damn it, subscribe and hit that notification button because... Uh, now, as I promised, I'm going to be making an effort to do one plus video a week, right? I was already doing one video a week pretty steadily, but uh, now uh, most weeks you might be able to expect me to do another video. And, uh, you know, every couple of weeks it'll probably be, that other video will probably be a live stream. 
maybe we'll have more videos featuring Bill the Elf if he's game. Daniel Cathay says, I would love to puff a pipe, but I can't where I live because I'm in the Seattle area. And I hope that speaks for itself. Well, it sounds like you've got much more serious problems, starting with the fact that you're living in Seattle. Josh James says, personal freedoms are known to cause butthurt in the state of California. Yes, indeed. Um, Let me see here. I'm going to skip a few things just to try to to get a to catch up here. Uh, Dave Pettit says regarding discrete application of mythic elements, excellent, insightful, and fascinating response. This is why I've I've subscribed, dude. Lion and Dragon just leapt up on my long list of future bound purchases. Yeah, well, if you want that kind of in, of, of context, you definitely want to check out Lion and Dragon and Dark Albion because that's the, the orientation I made for, for the setting and for the game. Super Fantasy Channel says, hey, Pundit, what do you think about Tecumel? Well, Tecumel was obviously, in one sense, an absolute work of genius. It was by far the most sophisticated setting for an RPG. It came out, like, it was one of the earliest settings, right? But, of course, M.A.R. Barker had made Tecumel as a kind of exercise in world creation before there was ever before he ever knew about rpgs but regardless of that as an rpg setting it would take ages like years and years and years before there was any setting that could lay claim to being anywhere as close as sophisticated as his setting um on the other hand Tecumel had this problem where it was just too damn weird to live, right? Like, it was just never, it was always too much of a unique kind of special beast of a, of a setting that, that, you know, any setting where you need to learn a pronunciation guide and, and basically do a bunch of linguistic study plus cultural studies as if you were almost taking, you know, like you could tell this was done by a university professor, right? And that this professor was doing it in the same way that he would do some kind of a course on linguistics. Um, it was never just, it was never approachable and you couldn't really approach it any way, right? And um, I think that a much better exercise is to make uh, settings based much more closely to those real world cultural elements that were inspirational for Barker's product, which was you know, uh, Indian and, and Asian and to some extent um, pre-Columbian American uh, cultures and, and having those, you know, like make a game that is sort of like, um, well, like Arrows of Indra does with India. You could have something similar with uh, Southeast Asia. You could have something similar with, say, the Aztecs or the Mayans. And any one of those would be a lot easier for a DM to approach than Tecumel was because Tecumel was just too weird and alien. Daniel Cathy says, I have a feeling about this already, but what's your opinion of GURPS as a system? Well, I'm not a big fan of point buy, so that's a big, big strike against GURPS. Aside from the point buy part, I'd say that mechanically, GURPS functions actually quite well around the 100 point range for characters and that is to say games where you're playing what are basically ordinary humans or or skilled humans 100 150 point range and games like modern conspiracy games or stuff like that um historical action games that are focused on being historical and not like uh you know um high you know high action cinema style but rather like if you want to run a game of the three musketeers but like as the musketeers really were and you know with this kind of gritty element to it that would work really well you know any type of gritty historical but the more points you put into the the characters the you know like the higher point games the less the the the, the more that i think grips just breaks down fred daniel says asks what do you think of glorantha <laughs> or trans and then daniel kathy asks trans or transhuman space well um 
I think Glorantha is just does a really weird job because it does try to focus on things like myth and archetype, but then like what it does is a really strange take on it. And I've never really liked Glorantha. I thought it was a, a kind of a wasted opportunity. Uh, transhuman space, I never got into either. I never thought it was a very good transhumanist game. The only transhumanist um, setting I really liked personally was the Mind Jammer setting, which started life as a source book for the uh, Star Blazer RPG and is now its own RPG. And there's even a traveler version of Mind Jammer. So if you want like a super advanced transhumanism setting, if you're a Traveler fan, check out the Traveler version of, of uh, Mind Jammer. I, I quite like that one. Grounded Axe Blade says, I thought inhaling cannabis is thousands of years old. Yes, cannabis and hashish. Neither of those were very common in Europe, though. That's not something that was really happening there. Um, but certainly hashish and stuff like that was uh, a, a, a thing that happened in like the Middle East. Scott Anderson says, what's your opinion of Frank Menser being a person? Well, Frank Menser is an old dude that, that really isn't, you know, like <laughs> he's obviously an embarrassment in some ways. Some of the things he said are embarrassing. It's like, you know, it's grandpa and grandpa isn't really taking care of the farm anymore. And <laughs> he's uh He's also, you know, a dinosaur in terms of the, you know, even from my point of view or from the, even, you know, even if you're not a feminist in any way, you can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, the, he's basically a dirty old man or what have you. But, but uh, there's also been a tremendous exaggeration from there, you know, like him trying to flirt with certain people in a really awkward way is not the same as someone, uh, you know, trying to sexually assault some someone at a con. It's not the same thing. And the idea that it is the same thing is, is downright stupid and insulting. So I think that, you know, Frank Menser shouldn't be unpersoned. I think he should be embarrassed of some of the stuff he's done, maybe, but he shouldn't be unpersoned. Um... Reese Nelson says, I'm curious as to what your take on Dungeon World is. Do you consider it a story game? Well, there was a big debate about this on the RPG site back when Dungeon World mattered. Um, the thing about Dungeon World is that what it is, is actually an attempt by the story gaming crowd to win over the traditional RPG crowd. So Dungeon World, when I first saw it and didn't really look into it in enough depth at the time, I'll admit... What I thought it was, was a story game that was meant to try to appear as if it was an RPG. So it's like, I thought it was a, an attempt at deceiving people into thinking, look, this is, you're playing D&D, haha, but it, it's, that's actually a story game. That's not actually quite what it was. Dungeon World actually was an RPG that was unbelievably influenced by story gaming to the point that it was an attempt at making an RPG that still technically fell within the RPG rules, but turning it into something that would function in a way that was like a, the way a story game functioned. It was a kind of a try a, a second attempt at making a story game that still falls within RPG parameters. Um, but it was still for the same purpose, really. It was meant to be to try to convince, to trick people into thinking that what they're going to get is a D&D style experience. When what they're actually getting is the experience of portraying a D&D &D game being played, right? Like the simulation of the playing of a D&D &D game, which is of course not what D&D &D &D is, right? D&D is playing in a living world with characters that are, you know, meant to become living people and you're playing in that world and, and you're engaging in the world. Here in Dungeon World, you're engaging in the experience of playing something like D&D, right? Do you get that difference? It's, it, it, it's a level of abstraction that is supposed to be, you know, it, it, I think it, it was made in a way that would allow pretentious story gamers to be able to get close enough to playing D&D without feeling ashamed of themselves for being lowered to what they believe is a game for the unwashed masses 
And at the same time, you try to trick D&D players into liking story game style pretentiousness. And so in both cases, it's just, you know, horrible. Daniel Cathay is turning in, but he says it was an excellent live stream. Very good. Well spoken. Well, thank you very much for turning out. I really hope that uh, you keep watching. Um, Super Fantasy Channel says, I may not agree with you on a lot of stuff, but I really enjoy your rants and perspectives on RPGs. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad that you are one of those rare people these days that can not agree with me and still watch and enjoy and think about it and, you know, make up your own mind. That's very important. Uh, Iron Cross says, I love the way you simulate monotheist to Christianity in your game without it actually being Christianity. I also use this cosmology with Mithras being Jesus and having different saints. Uh, yeah, I mean, I did that mostly as a vehicle. Like, for example, my current Lion and Dragon campaign, I'm, I just outright have the Christian church. I'm not, I, I, I'm not using any kind of a of a, um, of a trick to, to hide it, right? But I understood that, you know, a lot of people, that, that game now I'm playing with experienced players and they're, they've kind of been able to get into the medieval paradigm enough that it's not a problem. The problem you usually get in the modern day is that you'll get some, you know, some very rare people might just be like, I'm a Christian and I don't really want to role play in a game where Jesus is actually a thing. That's very unusual. Most Christians really wouldn't have a problem with that. But much more common will be, People will hear the term Christianity, and so they'll they'll throw in a bunch of postmodern ideas about what Christianity is. Um, in either case, like e even if you're not necessarily hostile as a person to Christianity, but obviously, if you have like any kind of issue, if at any moment you felt put upon by the Christian worldview or something like that, then you're going to have a huge problem dealing with playing in a world where fundamentally Christianity is an incredible force for good, right? Like that would be really hard for you if you if you feel upset that you were forced to go to church as a kid right so it saves a whole bunch of problems to just keep exactly the same church but call it the unconquered sun instead right as long as you as long as it's exactly the same concept of a universal um bureaucratic and monotheistic religious hierarchy that exists separate from the temporal hierarchy then it doesn't really matter if you're calling the deity of that that monotheism, Jesus or the unconquered son or, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. But it has to be monotheistic. It has to be an institutional church that has a hierarchy, that has strict rules, that has orders, that has monasticism. You have to have all those elements to make it medieval authentic. Um... Someone says, as, I, as Gen X, I remember the satanic panic very well. Well, yeah, and that still affects a whole bunch of people from our generation in the sense that we still want to imagine that the Republicans are the ones that want to take away our rock music and our, and our video games, when in fact, it's, it's now the Democrats that want to do that, right? It's the left that wants to do that. Um, Josh James says, the new book burners occupy the same niche as the moral majority did. They share their hatred for everything fun and transformative. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, there's been a direct correlation between um, the left becoming increasingly more pro-censorship and the right becoming increasingly more anti-censorship, right? And now, really, you end up seeing way more tolerant behaviors to ideological difference, to, to ideological diversity in the right which they didn't used to have, but now they're, they're definitely there, uh, than you do in the left. The left has a very, very, very narrow range of, ideal, of permissible ideological points, right? If you deviate in any way from that tiny window of ideological perspectives you can have, then you are to them a monster, right? But whereas the right, include, like the, the, the Republican Party includes in it everything from fundamentalist evangelicals on the one hand to outright atheists on the other, right? To dedicated uh, monotheistic, you know, um, a traditionalists, social traditionalists on the one hand, to twinks for Trump on the other, to, uh, you know, uh, anti-interventionists, uh, 
to all the way into interventionism, right? From pot smoking libertarians to teetotalers, right? That, that's all in there. And they all figure out that a way to, um, to be able to tolerate each other enough with the common understanding of the, the thing that binds them is this idea. They've come to realize this now that what they want most is not for anyone else to t get to tell them what to do, right? Don't freaking tell me what to do. That's what the right wing believes now. And the, the Christian right got over their impulse to want to tell other people what to do. And most of the, the uh, patrician right, the neocon right, is pretty much doomed now. They're just gone. So those two have stopped being assholes, you know, for lack of a better term. And now you have a coalition of people with wildly different ideas that are that come together on the point that it's nobody else's business what they do with, with their own lives, right? Um, so you have to not care that your neighbor is a fundamentalist uh, creationist dude. And he has to not care that you're a pot-smoking pansexual. You know, like it shouldn't matter. I shouldn't be able to, for, you know, you shouldn't be able to force your neighbor to claim to like pot or, you know, polyamory or something like that. And they shouldn't get to force you to pretend that you, you know, want to, to, to you know, to make your kid pray the, the Lord's Prayer every morning, right? And you shouldn't be able to force them to not, to, uh, to not get to make their kid pray the Lord's Prayer every morning. Uh, Todd Zercher says, speaking of blocking groups, the admin at the, Lord of, at the Lords of Gothstromer and Shadow Facebook group has decided to boycott any discussion of Lords of Olympus for reasons, even when he was proven to be incorrect. Todd Zercher said this. Um, I, I don't really use Facebook a lot for RPG stuff. I'm not familiar with that group. That's very interesting, though. I wonder who's running that group, because the group that was founded by... Um, the people who originally made Lords of Gossamer and the Shadow, who are very good people, and we allow all kinds of, you know, on the RPG site, um, there, you know, anyone is welcome to come and talk about Lords of Goth Gossamer and Shadow, and the creators of those games have come there and talked about it and been very welcome to do so. And on all of my, you know, like the MeWe, the old G Plus group, and in the MeWe group that I now have for Lords of Olympus you're very welcome to come and talk about Lords of Goth and Gossamer and Shadow. Um, and on the Google Plus group that was run by the makers of Logas, um, they had no problem with people talking about Lords of Olympus. So it seems really strange that they would have that different policy, unless it's not them and it's just some random asshole who's taken uh, without the permission of... Um, the uh, publisher of Logas has decided to make a Facebook page and boycott people that could potentially be Lords of Goth Gossamer and Shadow customers. So if you don't mind, share a link if you can. I don't know if you can post a link here. If not, put it in the comments later. Or if you can't put it in the comments, I don't know, um, send it to me on Twitter or MeWe or uh, Minds, whichever one you've, you've got me friended with so that I can find out more about this. I think that's very unusual. This is the first I've heard of it. But please do, uh, do let me know if you can. Uh, Gary Firash says, have you thought of publishing coffee recipes? I really love the questions here because it's like, here I am, I'm the RPG pundit. And I mean, this is totally cool. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complaining at all, but I just find it really amusing that people who watch the videos want to know about not just my thoughts on say RPGs or politics, but my perspective on stuff like pipes or, or even coffee. Right. Um, I actually only make a couple of coffee recipes. The key is to use a really nice, um, coffee row, you know, blend or to, to, you know, or even to get the beans. I used to actually, get the coffee beans and grind them myself with an old fashioned crank grinder, right? Like no electric grinder for me. But um, I came to realize that the expense of the cost of those beans wasn't really justified because if you're having, like if you're having that black or with just with sugar, you're going to notice a real difference in the quality of the coffee. 
But if you're making iced coffee with the Vietnamese style coffee maker and you're mixing it up with either condensed milk or other stuff, I used to use sweetened condensed milk, which is fine. But now I'm, I'm actually, I guess you could say it's a healthier option, but I'm doing it because I just found I really like the taste. I'm using this kind of um, plain sweet yogurt, right? Like a really thick yogurt and not, no, you don't want a diet yogurt or something like that, but you want like a Greek style yogurt. And, you, and that mixed with the coffee, as long as it's a sweet yogurt, it's, you don't have to add any more sugar and it's just fantastic, right? But that's basically the recipe. That's it right there. I don't do any weirder or fancier stuff. I'll correct myself. I, I often also add a tiny bit, a sprinkling of cardamom to the, to the coffee before I put it in the filter. So, or before I start filtering it. Cardamom goes really well with coffee. But that's it. Other than that, I make, I sometimes make Turkish or Greek coffee, however you want to put it. Um, and that's all. But uh, yeah, you, you really want to try that sort of coffee anyways. It's really good stuff. I don't know how much more I can talk about coffee though, so I'm just going to stop. <laughs> Josh James says, I would choose Dark Albion over porn at least 30% of the time. That is a ringing endorsement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nefarious Cole says, jo to Josh James, why not get dual use out of Dark Albion, both gaming and porn? I'm sorry, Nefarious Cole. But Dark Albion is not alpha blue. There is there is no porn in Dark Albion as far as I can think of anyway. Um, where were we here? Oh, here we go. Um, I quit smoking cigarettes a decade ago, began puffing a pipe years later. Huge difference, just puffing and not inhaling and I don't get the bad side effects and addiction, right? Well. You know, there's a debate about whether pipe tobacco is addictive or not. I know that, you know, it's kind of hard for me to judge because I've been smoking a pipe on a pretty much daily basis for <laughs> way over 20 years now uh, with, with a couple of rare exceptions, right? I can tell you that, you know, if I go on a long trip, sometimes I'm going like right across continents, right? Like from the southern part of South America to the northern part of North America, and that usually ends up meaning nowadays, because there's no smoking in most of the airports you stop in, that you're going to be well over 24 hours without having a single pipe, right? And I can go from smoking six pipes in one day to zero pipes in the next day. And there is really no physical effect of withdrawal from it. Um, the one time that I was actually hospitalized for, you know, in, in actually like being checked into a hospital, in that in, in this entire period of my life because I've you know I've, I've thank thank goodness I haven't had any serious health problems except this one time that I had a something that happened that required that I spend three days in hospital and of course I couldn't smoke during those three days when I came out I certainly had a psychological wish to smoke a pipe right but I didn't have some kind of physical urge like the sort of physical withdrawal or or you know crankiness or you know desperation that that you see cigarette smokings have cigarette smokers having um but yeah the reason you smoke a pipe is because you enjoy it that isn't that isn't to say that it doesn't have physiological effects it obviously does but if you're not inhaling pipe tobacco and if you're using a natural pipe tobacco because remember again cigarettes have been altered modern industrial cigarettes are altered to up the nicotine content to make it much more addictive, right? Um, but you are going to like the nicotine rush of a pipe and nicotine at any level has some kind of a quality of, yeah, uh, it, it does alter mood and stuff like that. So there is, at the very least, you're gonna have what you could call a light addiction. Um, Barry Daxblade says, isn't 5th edition actually more bad than the priors with their claiming monsters are PCs, good and evil are subjecting, are subjective, making warlocks with their devil packs being good? Well, <laughs> um, I think that, that, you know, those are elements of design choice. I, I don't think good and evil is strictly subjective 
in the actual text of fifth edition, the, the main rule book. I certainly think that it's been like over, it's been interpreted into that in a lot of 5e material afterwards, both official and unofficial and in campaigns and in some famous shows and in things like that. Um, I think, yeah, the idea of a lawful good warlock is kind of stupid, right? But um, the, so is from, from, my, from my point of view, so is the idea of a chaotic evil cleric or never mind a chaotic evil cleric, a chaotic evil paladin, right? Like those sort of things seem stupid to me also, right? Um, and monsters as PCs, well, that depends. Depends on the campaign you're doing, right? Like, I I think that the idea of having a lawful good orc, unless you have some really good reason for why that happened, is kind of dumb. But you might have a campaign where you want to play, you know, a chaotic evil orc. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I think you could overblow the, you know, you could over over bring bring to excessive proportions the extent to which you want to suggest 5e is somehow more corrupted than than earlier editions um and i think you can run out you I, I don't see why you couldn't use 5e with some modification to run dark albion so it depends a lot on what you do with it i can tell you one thing as somebody who worked on 5e that one of the goals of fifth edition was to make it much more modular than other wizards of the coast editions so that you can take stuff out or add stuff in without it screwing up the whole system like it would in third edition with a lot of stuff. So you can take out a whole bunch of the stuff you have moral objection to. Like there's no reason why you have to allow lawful good warlocks in your campaign. You can just take them right out. You can take out a whole bunch of stuff and add in a whole bunch of other stuff and, you, and the game is still playable. And I think that's one of the things that makes 5e less bad than other new school editions of D&D, that you can make what you want of it without having a huge complication. Um, wow, we're getting up on two hours here, but I'm going to try to keep going as long as I have battery life. I don't know how much battery life I have. And as long as I have, I should have a lot. And I don't, and as long as there's people that want to ask questions or make comments, oh, I'm at a 41%. I'm still okay. Um, your thoughts about the classic Marvel superheroes game, asked Brian Harris. I never found a superhero game I liked until Icons. Icons is the first superhero game I have ever liked as a superhero game. I never actually played Marvel superheroes. I read it a little, but I've never even run it. I did try to run DC Heroes once, and it was just an unbelievably unwieldy system from my point of view. It was just stupid. And, and superhero games have never been done really right for the most part, because it's very hard to do them right. <coughs> because there's a whole bunch of stuff there that almost is like, the, the, the temptation is to make them into a kind of a story game because the protagonism of a hero has to be a part of what you consider in the power level of a hero. How do you make a game where you have, where you can realistically have a guy like Batman beat um, someone like, I don't know, even Sinestro, right? Like, or never mind, like, you know, General Zod or something like that uh, without relying on Kryptonite, for example, right? That's another big problem there, right? So, like, yeah, the way that you could do that mechanically if you're trying to make it a strictly mechanical game where what matters are the powers that you've put your points into or whatever that you've purchased or your ability scores. See, none of that works because then either you have to find a way to cheat around making both Superman and Batman be like 1,000 point characters where Superman has, you know, invulnerability and super strength and flight and x-ray vision and heat vision and all of that sort of stuff. And Batman is a dude right, who has toys, but like, you know, there's no way that his toys add up to 1,000 points. So you're somehow cheating. You're making Batman super powered, whether you want to or not. Um, or you're just not doing that and you're doing some kind of, you know, like um, system where, you know, where you can't actually emulate the superhero genre, right? So I think icons with the way that they altered the fate system and how they use the termination points, as long as you skip out on that kind of optional thing of like getting to rewrite the world, which is an outright story gaming element, skip that part. But every, in every other respect, icons 
um, does a really good job of being able to simulate both power level and protagonism and making those in the right balance. Uh, Marvel superheroes, in my opinion, didn't quite do that. Nefarious Cole says, got the Traveler version of Mind Jammer. It's amazing, but a heavy read. Ah, George Wittlesbach, Lorraine McClary, and Hoopy has shown up and has asked, did you kill Catboy yet? Well, I hope you're still here, George, because in the most recent couple of adventures, there's a dude that's shown up called the man who will kill the Catboy and then the Sky Fuhrer who is now hunting Catboy. And he's hunting Catboy. He sees a, this is a bounded servant of the daemon patron known as Death, the spirit of Death, um, who is basically a hitman, a supernatural hitman, that is hunting down um, the... Uh, is hunting down the Catboy to try to assassinate the Catboy. And this person has been hired by a mysterious individual that Catboy has no idea who it is. This person's name is George Wittlesbach, Lorraine, McClary, and Hoopy. <laughs> so you are now in the game. And I'm going to give you a warning, George Wittlesbach. Part of how the Catboy plans to survive, even though it, you know, it was a nefariously brilliant plan, because anyone who tries to help the Catboy, if the Catboy is saved from the man who will kill the Catboy and then the Sky Fuhrer, that means the Sky Fuhrer won't die. And that means that if you're trying to help the cat boy, you must be a Sky Nazi, right? By all the modern day rules. So since nobody wants to be called a Sky Nazi, the cat boy is practically in this only on his own, right? He's the only, he's, he's, he's been isolated from potential allies. It was a really clever plan. But the cat boy's plan is to find George Wittlesbach, Lorraine McClary, and Hoopy and kill him. <laughs> so uh, look out. Um, do you have Fred Daniel says do you have any comment on the burning wheel or torchbearer uh, only that you should avoid them whenever possible uh, Josh James says I paid for Dungeon World once it was useful to me in that it showed me what I don't love in RPGs well I guess you got something out of it even if it was like by negative example uh, Blink Dog says got Cults of Chaos the other week excellent supplement thank you so much I'm really glad you liked it. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody checks out Cults of Chaos, Lion and Dragon, um, Dark Albion, and the RPG Pundit Presents series. If you want to support me and you, uh, you know, rather than donating to Patreon or something, you can support me by purchasing my products. And one easy way to do a small purchase of one of my products, if you don't want to spend like, I, I forget what Cults of Chaos is priced at right now, but I think it's like 16 or 17 bucks. That is pretty darn cheap for a uh, for a book of its quality, right? Like, you know, it has... Whoop, my cat got scared. It has fantastic production values. It has fantastic art. It's, uh, it's quite a big book. Um, so for the price, it's a really good price. So are Dark Albion and so are um, Lion and Dragon. But let's say you don't have... You don't. You can't spend higher than ten bucks. Let's say you can spend at most, say, five bucks. Check out any one of the seventy-four now uh, issues of RPG Pundit Presents on Drive Through RPG or at the Press's Intermedia website. And I bet you're going to find one that's got something interesting enough for you to want to buy and read. And that's a great way to monetarily support me is purchase more of the RPG Pundit Presents series. All right. Um, Josh James says, Frank has committed the high sin of being openly heterosexual in 2019. Well, yes, from the SJW point of view, but I'll point out that from the point of view of, you know, other people, you could say he's committed the high sin of being openly heterosexual badly in 2019, right? Like, uh, you know, there's, there's a way to be a dirty old man and uh, maintain some of your dignity, which mostly involves, you know, being being more of an admirer than just trying to like act on your <laughs> impulses and there's a way to be a mature man who ends up getting a younger woman and neither of those are what uh frank was doing right um super fantasy channel says pundit i know you've mentioned beyond the supernatural but what are your thoughts on palladium system games 
I think Palladium is a vastly unfairly attacked company. I think they've made excellent products that are, you know, tremendously not serious in many ways. And so that's why the serious, pretentious people hate Palladium so much. A lot of their games, especially stuff like Rifts, are games made to appeal enormously to 14-year-old boys or people who've just never really entirely matured beyond 14-year-old, year old, you're being 14-year-old boys, right? Like there's, you know, mechas and heavy metal type magic and occasional boobies, right? And this is like everything you want in an RPG when you're 14, right? Um, and they're, they're, but they're actually much better games than people think. The world building is really good in some of these games, the Robotech, um, Rifts. They have, they have very interesting campaign settings. They have a mechanical system that is definitely not perfect, but it's nowhere near as bad as the reputation some people have tried to make out for. And actually, Palladium is a, is a, is a really playable system if you learn how to play it. So, yeah, I like most of the Palladium system games. Um, Nefarious Cole says, The right has been increasingly taken over by traditional libertarians and constitutionalists, which needed to happen earlier, but better late than never. Yeah, I pretty much agree. I think there's room for a, a wide variety of opinions on the right. I think that what there's not room for is an authoritarian right. I don't think there's room for, um, you know, any kind of a identitarian right um, and there really isn't the, the, the you know race-based identitarian right is something that is really stuck in the margins of the right and will never be paid prop you know they'll never they'll never have proper influence of any kind thankfully whereas on the left the racialist identitarians are the people that are defining the agenda of the left so that tells you who's actually paying attention to the racists in their camp. Mm. Josh James says, remember when they tried to ban the word bossy a few years ago? They recoil in abject horror when you name them. Well, yeah, you remember and I remember, but more importantly, you know, people who are just turning 18 now remember. They remember having spent years being told in school about how you can't call girls bossy and uh, at the same time girls should be encouraged to be bossy right and that you know they remember they remember everything that has been told to them by every authority figure in their life which they are now starting to realize increasingly is a load of bullshit and that you don't have to listen to these people anymore they remember when their biggest hero pewdiepie who they know isn't a nazi was called a nazi and they they tried to take pewdiepie away right um and that was probably the biggest mistake the left has made in the last decade. And they just don't realize it yet because the nine-year-old army, you know, a lot of the nine-year-old army is about 16 now, not nine. But in a couple of years, they're going to be the 19-year-old army and they're going to vote. And then the left is going to be even more screwed. Um, oh, missed stuff here. Okay. Uh, Objects and Spaceman said, I watched with dismay as your G++ ones dwindled as the peer pressure mounted as a publisher. I hate needing to have an anonymous persona. Did you get contacted off the record often by other creators? Well, I don't think my G++ ones dwindled all that much, to be honest. Right up until the end, I was being really active. And I mean, after the OSR G++ group closed... You had this group of SJW infiltrators to the OSR that created what they called the Honorable OSR, which was the G plus group that they were going to try to take over the OSR with. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they were going to put litmus tests. So if you wanted to be part of the OSR from now on, including that group, you were going to have to pass their examination, right? And I set up the Inglorious OSR group on G plus and within you know days ended up outstripping them in terms of activity and in terms of following and that group now still exists on miwi so if you're on miwi check out the inglorious osr group which is the most exciting it's not the biggest the biggest is still you know the osr group that joseph Bloch runs which uh more power to him and check that one out too but if you want the to be part of the the punk kids of the osr go to the inglorious osr on miwi
George Riddlebuck, Lorraine McLaren Hoopy says, how's the Discord going? Well, I'm not really doing much on Discord. I I know I should get on there from time to time and check out, you know, the the, the good OSR Discord, not the shitty one run by SJWs. I think they've banned me from that one too. Somebody told me, they had to tell me that they banned me because I never go there. I have people that spy on on things that happen there and inform me from time to time, which is great. Um, Discord is just something I have you know, trouble really committing to in a big way because, uh, I don't know, like I, uh, maybe I'm too old for it. I, I'm not sure. I, I just, it, it seems to be anything that's too much like a chat room and has no permanence to it or no ability to go back through it in a serious way is, is to me not, not ideal as far as social media. Uh, I get why people like it. Don't get me wrong. And I will try to check on it from time to time. Um, are are you using any kind of character monster figures in your OSR sections? I'm not sure what you mean by figures. If you mean miniatures, the answer is no. I've never used miniatures in my RPG gaming. Um, I've just I've always been a theater of the mind type of guy. Nefarious Cole says, I smoke my pipe once a day when the weather's nice. Almost never in the winter, I smoke outside while reading. Well, fair enough. I smoke a lot more. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, Dave, Daniel Cathy, do you wish you had not started smoking or indulging in nicotine? I regret certain aspects, but relish the experience. No, I, I don't regret it at all. I mean, I like I said, I never really smoked cigarettes. I never smoked cigarettes. I mean, I think I tried one cigarette once in my life, right? Like, because I wanted to see what it was like, but but I'm not someone that started out smoking cigarettes. I didn't smoke anything as a teen. I started smoking cigarettes when I turned 18, uh, smoking uh, pipe when I turned 18. Um, and I never, like, I didn't go from cigarettes to a pipe. I've only just smoked a pipe. And so I have no regrets about it at all. I've enjoyed it tremendously and, uh, you know, it's it's been a huge source of pleasure in my life. And I haven't had, thankfully, because I mean, I know that there are some increased risks from pipe smoking. Um, but uh, thankfully, thus far, I haven't personally had to suffer any of them. And uh, well, I'm very grateful for that. But, you know, you have to also accept in life that longevity is not as important as fun that living, you know, shitty years at the end of your life because you've chosen to try to extend it by missing out on a whole bunch of stuff is not really all that worth it. You know, death is not the worst thing that could happen to you. Jellio says, the final boss in internet shitlords. Exactly. <laughs> Curiously enough, I didn't say that at the beginning of the show because I was doing the sound test. So again, if you're just tuning in now, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in internet shitlords. Um, Daniel Cathy says, what's the highest powered campaign you ever ran or played in? I'm assuming highest powered D&D campaign because like a beginning campaign of Lords of Olympus is higher powered than any D&D campaign ever. Um, but if you're talking D&D, the highest powered would be um, two different... Uh, Rule Cyclopedia, BCMI, uh, D&D campaigns, in both cases that went from level one until, uh, in one case, until the Immortal Quest, until level 36, basically, and in the other case, right into um, Immortal level play. So, really high level. Some people are saying, I think Icons kind of sucks. Okay, well, you're allowed to think that way. I ran an Icons campaign, uh, my Golden Age superheroes campaign, and, and it went really well, and I really liked it. But, you know, uh, you don't always get that. Um, Camilo de Melo says, The Inquisitor. <laughs> the, I... I the Inquisitor is a character from that campaign, yeah. Um, 
Daniel Cathay says, uh, don't even listen to this idiot. The values in the tables and the background information with regards to Cult of Chaos. I must have missed someone posting somewhere that they didn't like Cult of Chaos, maybe. I don't know. But uh, yes, the tables and background information are pretty much what makes Cults of Chaos awesome. Um, we've all had time, Axe Blade says, we've all had time to roll up a personal fighter. Come on, DM. Give us a 40 person encounter right now you if you're watching my channel you should know i do not like live play i don't like any kind of online gaming I've, i don't play by skype i don't play roll 20. i play face to face and that's it super fantasy channel says i have almost all of the medieval authentic rpg pundit presents soon i'll have all of them and then the last sun supplements thank you so much super fantasy channel i really appreciate that but i also know that there must be a lot of that stuff that you're finding really enjoyable to read and hopefully that you'll find really enjoyable to use in your campaign so i i as much as i do very much thank you for your patronage i know you're getting a good value for your investment there daniel kathy says okay for real i have to go to sleep all right good night and thank you very uh, very good of you to come uh, Blink Dodd says, curious about Uruguay, why did you move there? Was it for the freedom? Well, you know, I do like the kind of social freedom that I have in Uruguay. Uruguay is a country that's kind of like, it's very relaxed about everybody doing their own thing, right? And it feels a lot less socially constrained than Canada. Um, but no, the reason I moved to Uruguay was because I came here as a tourist. I just fell in love with every aspect of the place, its culture, its warmth, its people. It's food, uh, the economics was right. Um, so I, you know, tore up my return ticket and I, and I stayed and that's that. Um, Sam K says, do you think the left will get their way eventually in the culture war and in the real world and in our hobbies? Their ideology is embedded in education, media, and now the culture. Um, it, is, it is hard to say, but the thing is, what I will say is this. I don't think the left will get their way in as much as what most people on the left would want to get, right? I think the only people on the left that might get their way if, if we don't do our job right enough is the people that are, what are really hoping for is a complete collapse of all civilization. You know, that might happen. What's never going to happen is either a kind of socialist utopia, which is what a lot of naive people on the left are hoping for or a world where you know a, a, a western world where a group of feminist and social activist intersectionalists will get to run the lives of everybody else and will get to be a special protected class that that get all kinds of benefits that other people don't um while getting to decide what you know who gets to be part of that class and for that to be a sustainable system. Um, that isn't gonna happen. It, so the left getting their way will take the form of either um, an a, a, a atrocity filled totalitarian state that will eventually be overthrown and then reviled for all time, or a uh, unviable state of incredibly incompetent people that will rapidly be devoured by foreign powers um, or some kind of a complete collapse of civilization. But none of those three end up with people on the left actually being happy, I think. They'll end up with people on the left either being put up before a firing squad or being murdered by enemy troops or... Uh, being eaten by another human being or something like that, right? Like so, like it's not a good ending for them. The 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 good ending is either the left is stopped or you know nobody wins, right? Uh, Brian Harris says, "Have you looked at the new blue rose? Is the venisonocracy still intact?" Well, I've looked at the hype for the new blue rose, but then it kind of just fell off the radar. So like, no, I haven't actually looked at the book. If indeed the book has even come out yet, I don't know. It's kind of a has been at this point, right? And especially given that Green Ronin is now a victim of the left devouring itself, right? That certain people on the left are not happy at all with Nicole Lindros and the Green Ronin people because they apparently defended a very good friend of theirs who works at Green Ronin who was given a Me Too accusation. So there you are. That's, that's what happens when you get woke and go broke. 
Um, Trevor Hurst says, who was the guy you debated on a live chat last summer? That was the first time I heard you. I'm not sure who it was I debated. Um, trying to think of what you're referring to. Because, I mean, other than on this channel, and this channel has never had a guest, um, the places where I have spoken live have been either Spanish language OSR shows, I've done a couple of those, or Inappropriate Characters, which is the other channel that I'm involved in, which you should all check out and subscribe to as well. They, we do about one show a month, and that's me and Venger Satanis and Grim Jim, uh, three of the most censored people in the gaming hobby, getting together to say very inappropriate things about RPG news and controversy and events. And it's a fun, it's a fun show. And if you're subscribed to the RPG Pundit channel, please search for inappropriate characters and subscribe to that because you're going to have a really good time. Um, George Whittlebach, Lorraine, McClary, and Hoopy says, is the clown world meme just a psyop of, by the Royal Order of Jesters? <laughs> uh, Mirth is the king. Uh, I presume so. I mean, it's obviously just one of... Like, I mean, I think eventually we've got to figure out a way to, like... Jeez, I don't know. Like, we have to... I, I think that the 4chan trolls... I say we, but it's really them. I mean, I'm not doing any of this. But I think it's amazing how often the left just, just keeps falling for the same old stupid trick over and over again, right? So, like, milk is now racist. You can't, you can't drink milk. You're a racist if you drink milk. The OK sign is a racist. Uh, they're trying to make the rainbow flag <laughs> into something that, oh, it's racist, right? Like, this notion that anything that is declared to, by, by someone on the Internet to be a symbol of white supremacy or something like that instantly makes it so and then you must never associate with it again right like um how, we have to find I, I hope they keep finding ways to make it like have their advantage oh, oh voting get them to think voting is white supremacy and then that anyone who votes is a white supremacist and none, none of them will vote <laughs> and, and that'll just solve a bunch of problems it might save california you never know mm. Like really clowns, yeah. Okay, clowns are <laughs> clowns are a symbol of white supremacy for fuck's sake. <laughs> I mean, seriously. It just shows you how unbelievably ridiculous this the the, the like how how completely irrational the left has become, right? Um Let's keep looking here at what we've got. Iron Cross says, I appreciate your rant about SJWs, but can you do uh, more videos on medieval realist stuff? Is that what you said? I've lost the section here. Uh, can you do more videos on medieval realist campaign construction? Well, yeah, I can. I can try to. Um, give me more topics that you want to hear about for medieval, medieval realist campaign construction. Recommend it. Go on my blog on, you know, on the, the, the blog entry I made advertising this live stream and post your suggestions and I will certainly put them on the list. Craig Litton says, did you ever use the Wilderlands of High Fantasy? Yes, yes, I did. Um, great set. Um, and, uh, you know, the Wilderlands is a cool setting. The short says, what else is milk white? Well, it doesn't even have to be. I mean, clowns are multicolored, right? Like, Pepe is green. It doesn't, the color isn't the thing that does it, really. You just need the, the flimsiest of goddamn pretexts, you know. Um, Neil Bulrigi says, too many corn cob. I don't think there is such a thing. I, I'm perfectly happy having a bunch of corn cobs. 
it looks like we've caught up and we are now also well past the two hour mark so it's probably getting on time to stop um i want to thank everybody who came out we've had a very good uh viewing rate here and uh again thanks to absolutely everyone who subscribed um that's really it's really great of you all and please again keep subscribing share this video share my other videos um keep letting people know about this place let's see if we can make the 2000 subscriber special happen a lot faster than the 1000 did and uh if you want to support me monetarily if you really insist on just throwing money at me then you know support me on patreon there's a patreon link or you know there's a paypal link that connects to my blog uh but if you're uh if you want to support me and you know get something in return check out my products check out my books like cults of chaos check out uh lion and dragon dark albion lords of olympus um arrows of indra buying any of those is a way to get money to me and uh and to get something for yourself and check out the rpg pundit presents pdf series because there's a whole bunch of pdfs there that cost just a couple of bucks great way to support me and a great way to get something for supporting me thanks to everyone um just a couple little notes now neo Bulregi says uh what are you smoking right now i'm smoking dunhill elizabethan I love Dunhill Elizabethan. It's a great blend, and I smoke it quite often. Right now, though, I'm I've got my um, Brigham uh, anniversary pipe, and I'm smoking in it. Just getting close to the end of uh, Image Latakia, which is one that I already mentioned in this stream as one of my very favorite blends. It's a really great blend. It's easy to smoke on a, you know, you, you can smoke at any time of day, and it's a uh, hundred percent pure tobacco. Blink Dog says, let's get you to 2K subscribers. That's the spirit, man. It depends on you guys. Thank you all so much. <coughs> but also, keep up the good work. The battle doesn't stop here. Go out and share my videos. And when you share the videos, people subscribe. Encourage your friends. Get us moving. Let's get, <laughs> let's get up to where we can challenge T-Series. <laughs> you never know. Uh, thanks to everyone again. Watch them while you're at work. Um, I'm sorry for the Schwartz who has a smoke-free environment at his work where he wants. He sees me, he hears about me and my pipes, and he wants to, he wants to, to pull his out. Um, yeah, I usually smoke a pipe when I watch exciting YouTube videos. Uh, thanks to all of you so much, and uh, I'll be in touch really soon. I will probably release another video later on this week. Also, I can say it ahead of time. Check us out on Sunday, the 28th of April. There will be an episode of Inappropriate Characters. And believe me, I'm, it really surprises me how many people are subscribed to my channel that have not yet subscribed to Inappropriate Characters. That is a great show. It's so much fun, the banter between me Avenger and Grim Jim, I think, makes it really, really cool. It's only one episode a month, but, but you know, it's worth the subscription. So if you haven't watched it yet, check it out and subscribe to Inappropriate Characters. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. We will see you soon. As I just said, currently smoking uh, Brigham Anniversary Pipe with Image Latakia. And my cat says bye to you, too. Well, she, she would if she wasn't sleeping adorably by my side here. Take care, everyone, and thank you so much.